Is that okay? I'm not sure. Huh? No. It's fine. Yeah, you can also move it. Uh, you can keep the whole thing in the same Yeah, that's if you what want. I was saying. Uh, yeah. To move it uh, here, it's also good for me because I don't have to walk around. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, very well thanks for putting up with all our uh, logistics and arrangement so so this is at CS 6150 it's advanced algorithms and uh, so my name is Aditya Bhaskara I'll show you my uh, contact information and stuff in a little while so today I'll, we'll just talk about a general introduction to the course we'll talk about some logistic issues and so on and uh, that's the general yeah, and next next class on onwards we'll start with this. Okay. All right. So first, a quick show of hands. So how many of you here are first year either masters or PhD students? Okay. So this is uh, how many of you are actually not first year, maybe second year or something like this. Okay. And. Uh, Actually, another question is: For how many of you is this the the first graduate class, or one of the first few? Okay, that's uh, that's good. So, so the thing to remember is that in grad in grad classes, usually there'll be a lot more homeworks, and uh, it's somewhat less of a focus on grades. So, in some sense, grading will be a bit more relaxed. But on the other hand, it's a lot more work. So, you have to brace yourself for that. And uh, how many of you are undergrads? Just a few. So this is a relatively small number. So yeah, so so have you guys taken 4150 before this? Yes. Many of you? Okay. Yeah, so it's not a strict necessity, but uh, it would if you've taken 4150, a lot of stuff will at least look somewhat familiar. Uh, although we will do much more proofs than 4150. Okay. So that's the so that's a big thing. And another question that I often like to ask is, uh, 
How many of you have uh, taken your last algorithms class more than, let's say, five years ago? Usually there's a few people, okay. Yeah, so, so this is something where you might find it initially a bit harder to adapt, but, uh, but hopefully it should be fine. Okay, so I, I would invite you guys to just take the homework zero and make sure you're fresh, uh, you're somewhat updated on. So, so this is something. And uh, so the final thing is, are there folks here who have not taken either a discrete math or a probability class? By discrete math, I mean something that covers graphs and basic things like this. So that's very good because we'll use a lot of discrete math and probability in this course. So if you've not taken it, I would, I mean, I would prefer if you took a more elementary course before and then kind of came. Okay. All right. So, so let's start. All right. So what are algorithms, right? So we see algorithms everywhere. So, so this is the formal definition of the word according to Google. So this is, uh, so it's just a set of rules by which uh, some computation is done. Right? So that's basically an algorithm. Note that a computer need not be involved in the definition of an algorithm. Right? It's just a it's just a procedure that uh, takes some input and produces something. Okay. And it has some uh, origins that uh, come from uh, the Middle East and so on. Okay. So you can read up more about this in the okay. so, so that's the definition of an algorithm. It's just a set of rules by which uh, you, do, you perform a computation. Okay. And in fact, early examples of algorithms like the famous Euclid's GCD algorithm, they were discovered way before computers ever came. So, that's just a brief introduction. And of course, I don't have to motivate algorithms these days because you see algorithms everywhere. Right? So when you when you issue a search query or when you just speak to your phone or anything like this, uh, there are like complicated algorithms that are behind the scenes doing all this work for you. Right? And so the same. So this is an example of network routing. So. So we see algorithms everywhere today. And in fact, also in some sensitive areas. Like nowadays, people use algorithms to figure out whom to hire, things like this, right? whom to interview. So that's uh, so algorithms are everywhere. And they're also there in nature. So there's a view of evolution as an algorithm, okay, where uh, organisms have some objective function. They're striving to optimize it. And there are also some beautiful examples like birds flocking. And it turns out that there are some very elegant algorithms that uh, if you've never seen pictures like this, these are just a bunch of birds that have naturally evolved that shape. Okay? And clearly the birds don't try to form the shape. Right? So, so, so they, do, they perform some very simple local operations that end up with beautiful structures. So, yeah, so, so you see algorithms in nature all the time. Okay? So, so that's some general motivation. And I wanted to start with the goals for the course. So what are the general goals? So we'll talk about the basic principles of designing efficient algorithms. And what we mean by efficient depends on the context. Okay. So for some problems, you know, maybe you want some algorithm that runs in a certain running time. Or something like that. For some other problem, maybe it's something else. Okay. So, but that's the general idea. And some, for some, in some cases, maybe we don't care about the running time. Maybe we just care about how much space the algorithm is using, or something like that. And, uh, so, if, if there are some systems folks, then maybe you care about some communication between machines or something like that. Okay. So, so what we mean by efficient depends on the context. So that's the first thing. And we talk about. Uh, various, uh, how you analyze the running time of utilization and so on. And in general, our focus will be on reasoning about algorithms. Okay? So we want to prove formally that an algorithm behaves in a certain way. Okay? So that's the goal of the course. And uh, we'll also emphasize on proving the correctness of algorithms. Okay? So this is something maybe is not emphasized that much in undergrad curricula, but that will be a main focus for us. Which is, uh, yeah, whatever algorithm you come up with, we want to guarantee mathematically that it's doing what it's supposed to do. Okay. 
And while you need this, so this is very important in practice, right? Like uh, as I told you, algorithms are used everywhere. So you don't, you want to be able to reason about what you're doing. So so you want uh, when you come up with an algorithm, it's not just you try it and see if it works or not. You you'd like to be able to certify that it always works. Okay, like one can't just change the input a little bit and make it fail or something. So, so that's why we emphasize improving correctness in this code. And you'll see that this is non-trivial. And sometimes we'll see some non-trivial examples of where of places where algorithms seem correct, but they're actually they fail on certain kinds of inputs. So that's the thing. And finally, we'll also look at understanding the limits of computation. Like are there tasks that you cannot hope to solve very right? quickly? Okay. So that's called interactability. And uh, We'll come to that towards the end of the course. Okay. Alright, so these are the basic uh, goals. So, any questions or thoughts you have about this thing? By the way, throughout the course, you should feel free to ask, interrupt me and ask questions. You okay, just raise your hand and uh, it will be a relatively interactive thing once we start uh, once we start talking about the exit. So, yeah, feel free to interrupt. Yeah, one question you should be thinking of is will we be doing any implementation in this course? I don't know if you can read this, but it says implementation. Right? So we will not explicitly do any implementation of uh, any coding in this class. Okay, so it will just be reasoning about things, coming up with algorithms, writing pseudocode. Okay? So we will not be writing any explicit code. Uh, but it is understood that you should be able to implement any of these algorithms. So any algorithm that we discuss in class, you should be able to implement it. In fact, I would encourage you to think about implementing it and come up with like possible issues you might face okay, uh, when we actually do these algorithms. And uh, often you'll realize that there are steps that maybe we skipped over in class which if you're actually trying to implement it, you'll find that there's some decisions to be made that we haven't covered. Okay, and that is normal. Okay, so that's... Uh, uh, yeah, so we won't be explicitly doing anything. Right. Okay, so let me also talk a little bit about the logistics for the course. So, so the course homepage, how many of you have checked out the course homepage for uh, yeah, very few? So let me show let me show the course homepage. So this is on Canvas. So this is exactly the reason why for discussions we'll be moving, instead of Canvas, we'll be doing uh, Piazza. Okay? Because uh, Canvas is usually a lot of trouble to log in, just to do this dual authentication and so on. So, all right, so let's see this. OK, 
Okay, so so this is the course page, all right, and uh, let me just make sure that it's uh, uh, the course. Yeah, so I have to. Sorry? There's a description on the page. Ah, okay, so the start date is not defined. <laughs> so every year it changes a little bit, so we have to keep. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, I mean it's probably better for me to figure this out offline. So let's so let's uh, yeah. If you go to the home page, I believe there should be just a publish button on the right. Okay. It must change from last year. Yeah, so that's what I thought, but there isn't one. So probably at the end of it. All right. So this is covered default undergrads and grad students are the same. Yeah, so I have merged all these courses on Canvas. So you you should see yourself in the same section. Okay. So yeah. Okay, so good. Now that we have this, all of you can, uh, can open. And uh, this is roughly what I've described about the course just now. And uh, so I've also listed out some some prerequisites. So as I was saying, an undergrad level discrete structures course. Okay, and uh, undergrad level data structures course also would be very helpful. So, so those are the prerequisites. I also have some links to uh, book chapters. Okay, so this is actually a full book, but uh, these chapters would usually suffice for the for the sake of this course. And uh, so, so here there are some lecture notes that you can go and look, and uh, these are pretty elementary much. Okay, so if you have any issues with uh, where you think that uh, you're not following some of the discussion. Because of prerequisites, these are good places to look. Okay, and of course, you can also always ask me or the TAs. Okay, and uh, so the other thing is that we will be using Piazza for for class discussion. How many of you used Piazza before? Okay, so many of you used this. So so on Canvas itself, you'll see this link on your left. Okay, so this is one place you can go, but there's also a Piazza link for the course that you can go to directly. Okay, and uh, yeah, so, so so that's what we'll be using for discussions. Okay, so let's. All right. So the next thing you should know about is that uh, homeworks are all submitted via Canvas. Okay, so so you will see an assignment submission thing. In fact, I will quickly enable uh, today afternoon. I will enable a submission for homework zero, so you guys can can check it out and so on. Okay, so homework zero is a prerequisite for homework. So I can actually show you guys. Oh, this side. So, so it has a few problems, and they're mainly meant to test your background. Okay, so you don't. Have, so this will not be graded, but you're welcome to submit it if you think you have some questions about, or if you're not very sure about your background. Okay, so I will give some feedback. It won't be like a full grading of it, but I will give feedback about about whoever submitted. Yeah. All right, and it's useful for me if you submit by this weekend. Okay. Because uh, I can take a look on Monday. Or so. All right. So that's uh, that's some basic uh, statistics. Back. Yeah. So and again. Uh, so this is uh, my name.
time and uh, this is my email address if you want to contact me about the course okay so if you send to my regular email i may be very slow at responding or it might uh, it might get lost so please email me at this at this email id uh, if uh, for things about this course okay so that's something this is my office number these are where my office hours will happen so you might want to take a note of that All right, and uh, so the next uh, information is uh, we have three TAs. If you thought my name was not complicated enough, then these are <laughs> some you should take a look at. So, so, so let me introduce them. They're all sitting here. So Vivek is uh, one person. So Vivek will be in charge of will be the contact person for all grading questions. Okay, so grading related question. Okay, so he's the one you should bug if uh, you are unhappy with your uh, <laughs> with the grades you get. Okay, so uh, I mean he won't do it himself. He will uh, delegate it, but it's always nice to have a contact person. Okay, so all right. So so that's uh, okay. and uh, the next TA is uh, Pega. So she is uh, yeah. So she also has some responsibility, but it's uh, un yes. unstated. Yeah. So and uh, and finally, Kanchana is the third TA. So yeah. So these are folks you should know, and uh, their office hours. Each of them will have two hours of office hours. Uh, so they will put them up on Canvas before the end of the week. Okay. Hopefully today, but before the end of the week for sure. Okay. So so each of them will have a two-hour slot. For office hours. Okay. So, are there folks who who have a strong preference to uh, evening office hour, like something after 5 p.m.? Like some of you may be like partly working or something like that. And uh, is there a strong preference for anything? Okay, good. Yeah. So, if not, then it's great. Yeah, you guys can fix whenever you want. So, all right. <coughs> So and then quick thing about grading. Okay, so so you'll have six homeworks and best five of which will count towards your grade. There will be like sixty percent. I'll come to you in a little. Okay. So and beyond that, there is a midterm and a final exam. So I forgot to add the dates for this, but it might be the uh, <laughs> yeah. So the midterm. So I was going to propose a date of it. It will be in class, and it will be on October third. Okay, so this is the Thursday before uh, fall break. I just wanted to like formally announce it. And uh, if you guys have any serious, I will finalize this like sometime later today. But if you have serious restrictions about it, something like that, just let me know. Okay, so some strong references. Uh, if you, like uh, I, I can either do it that week or one week before that. Okay, so it's a strong argument for one way or the other, and it will change. But tentatively, it will be October third, okay, which is uh, the Thursday before fall break. All right. And the date for the final exam, we don't really have a choice in this. It's determined by the university. So this year it will be on Wednesday, December eleventh, from ten thirty to twelve thirty, and it will happen in the same. Week. Oh, so you have oh yeah, for the homework, um, do you use like logic to compile? Oh yeah, yeah I will uh, come come to that. Yes, I do use that. Okay. Any other questions about the about the grading? Yeah. So there's no project. Yeah. So this time there's no project because. Uh, I think this time the class size is a little bit bigger than it used to be. Uh, so yeah, so there's no project. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah, so a midterm maybe, yeah, some people may prefer a project instead of a midterm, but uh, I think it's just uh, yeah, with a lot of students it's logistically much more convenient to do a midterm. So right, any other questions? Okay, 
and uh, so I have also put up a link to all the course policies. So these are all uh, important things that you should uh, you should read. Okay. And, uh, All right. So, oh, actually, maybe I should uh, mention a couple of these things because they're probably worth mentioning. So, one is that uh, about collaboration and all that code and so on. Okay. So, in all the homeworks, you're allowed to collaborate. In fact, you're encouraged to talk to your peers about homework questions. Uh, but you should mention everyone whom you've spoken to. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So, so, so you must write down your own solutions. Okay. So you can you can just discuss, uh, but you have to write down your own solution. Okay. And that is uh, that we will actually implement. If we find the exact same writing, then you will be penalized. Okay. So, so please read this document. If something is not clear. Uh, send me email or ask me in the next class. Okay. So this will have, uh, yeah. So so you are not supposed to ask for other students' assignments, uh, and you are also not supposed to like search around for solutions. Okay. So this again, it's uh, tricky to implement for us, but we have found cases in the past where uh, we've had to disqualify people because they. I mean, it was just like a copy of whatever they found out. Okay, so all right. So these are the, the, these are just yeah, so somewhat naturally on a board. Okay. Yeah, and again, like I was saying, you should cite all the sources that you should, that you referred to. Okay, even if you searched on and found something relevant. Just cite the source, okay, so that we are aware. Okay, so and of course for the exams, uh, there's no collaboration. So yeah, and then uh, there's also like policies that you may have seen in other classes as well. These are uh, somewhat standard university level policies. Uh, I just encourage you guys to read all of them. Okay, so there's uh, wellness and the section of contact and safety statement. All right. So these are just some course policies. And uh, so, any questions about grading and general course policy? Yeah. Are there exams open? No. Yeah. So for the exams, you can bring anything, but you're uh, not allowed to talk to the neighbors or anything. <laughs> Okay. So you can bring anything you want. You're not a, you're not allowed to use your laptops. Okay. Uh, uh, even if you do use it, you can. Uh, I mean, you have to be offline. Okay. So yeah. If we find people searching around, then they'll obviously fail. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good question. So anything else? Yeah. Do we have the responsibility to protect our own writings, or is if I just put my writing online and someone edited. Yeah, so uh, yes, you're not supposed to share your writing. So that was also in the policy. Okay, you're not supposed to publicly share or even to a smaller <laughs> group of people share uh, your homework. Okay. You're allowed to discuss it in person, but uh, please don't share it so that people can just uh, view it as is. Yeah. How does that relate to like Piazza, with, for example, to Oh, this is like partially my ideas for the solution, but then, like, so what if I get like half the solution? Off the yeah, so try not to be a very like give out half the solution. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, obviously there's a line to draw there which has to be determined based on, I mean, on a case by case thing, right? Like what you think of as half the solution may not be what somebody else thinks of as half the solution. Okay, so so please discuss, but uh, but, but but don't like give out the whole thing. Okay, so, uh, or if I mean, use Piazza more as a thing of asking for clarifications rather than like a group discussion of the solution itself. Okay, so so that's all. All right. Okay, so great questions. Anything? Any more? All right. Okay, so this is what uh, we're coming to. This is what somebody had asked. 
right? So, how do you submit the homework? Okay, so we are relatively strict about this. Okay, so we would like you guys, we'd like all most of our students to know how to use LaTeX. If LaTeX is too much for you, then you can also use Markdown. Okay, and uh, how many of you have have not used LaTeX in the past? Okay, so that's a decent number. So, so I would encourage you guys to try uh, Homework Zero because that's an easy way to practice uh, your LaTeX skills. And uh, you can also use Markdown, which is like a like a simple way to get good formulas into into your PDF document. Okay, so look for Markdown. That's actually a very clean editor that I like. I mean, I don't know if there are alternatives actually. But so this is called uh, Dipora. Okay, so this is a very clean editor for Markdown, and uh, I find it very convenient to write short notes and stuff. Okay, so yeah, there might be alternatives, so look for those. Okay, and all homework should be submitted as PDFs and uh, on Canvas. Okay. All right. Yeah, and you will realize that uh, once you start using LaTeX, you will not want to go back to Word. Yeah, things will look very clean. Okay, and this is what I was saying. If you're new to LaTeX, start your homework early, try Markdown, so on. And uh, in general, try to submit homework zero on Friday or Saturday. Uh, there's no strict deadline for this, but if you don't submit by this weekend, chances are I might not be able to give you guys feedback. So, okay, so because this won't count towards your grade. All right, and uh, so I've already mentioned this, the citation collaboration. Okay, so let me start with a little bit of prerequisites. As I was saying, some. Uh, some level of comfort with data structures and mathematical analysis <coughs> is something that we will assume in this course. So, okay, so let's see. So first, uh, in terms of basic data structures, how many of you have not heard of any of these terms? Like uh, other, uh, like, let's say binary search trees. Paul, have you seen them? That's again surprising. Okay, so how would, uh, like when you think of binary search trees, what comes to mind? Pointers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, okay, so that's one thing, yeah. So we, we will see how that should probably not be something that comes to mind. <laughs> but, uh, but it's true, right? I mean, that, that's how people are taught. There, there's a lot of, uh, uh, but, but what's in some sense the, the key thing? What do binary search trees do for you? In every step, we have two options, either we go left or right. So we, sh we should start from basic and based on some notation, we decide which path we should go in every node. So you're explaining the mechanics, right? But when we think of data structures, this is something I'll get to more in the next, in the next class. You should be thinking in a somewhat more abstract way. So when I ask you what do binary search trees do for you, uh, yeah, the through sets we implement sets with binary Yeah, so you so it's a way of keeping track of a set of numbers, right? So binary search trees are a data structure that allow you to store a set of numbers, right? So arrays also allow you to store a set of numbers. Lists allow you to store a set of numbers. So what's special about binary search trees? Yeah. It stores it in an organized fashion that allows you to try to search time you can. Say, well, if it's bigger than this number, then don't even care about the other side of the tree. So, what he's saying is that it's a way of storing a set of numbers. So, let's, uh, so all of these are different ways. What is special about binary search trees is that you can very quickly find out if a number is present in the set or not. Okay. So allow you a query is present. Okay. 
I hope you guys can read my handwriting because uh, if not, I can write a bit slower, but just let me know. Yeah, as the course progresses, I've observed that my writing degenerates. So I will try not to. <laughs> okay, so hopefully now it's fine. Okay, so binary search trees have this nice property that you can very quickly tell if, uh, if a query number x is present in the setup. Okay. And so that's the special thing about this particular data structure. And so it turns out data structures are all about compromise, right? So, so in arrays and lists, it turns out that you can add elements, delete elements very, very quickly. But in binary search tree, that takes a little bit longer. But on the other hand, you get the nice property that uh, you can very quickly tell if something is present. Okay, so that's how you should think about data structures. We'll see more in the next class. But uh, but in general, you should think about them in a bit more abstract way. Okay, so yeah, so that's part of the goal in this course. Like we'd like to be able to reason about things rather than going into the mechanics of how you implement. It. Good. So no pointers. <laughs> so, all right. So so the next uh, thing is asymptotic analysis. So hopefully all of you have seen this, which is uh, the big O notation. Well, when you are talking about the running time of an algorithm, okay. So we we think of or, or like the complexity of that or the time complexity of that algorithm. We usually don't care about constants. So actually. So why is that? Why why do we not care about constants? Because constants are terribly. I mean, you would think that in practice they're very important, right? Like something that takes ten to the hundred times n is probably much better than uh, ten times n squared. So if I have two algorithms like this, then uh, one would probably prefer this one, that, and that is true, right? But uh, but for the sake of this course, most of the time, or from the point of view of asymptotic complexity, this is significantly better than this. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, any thoughts about why this might be? Yeah. Bigger n, obviously. Yeah. So for bigger n, this is definitely true. And the other reason is that usually when we think of how the algorithm behaves for two different values of n, let's say your n doubles. Then in the first case, you clearly know that this also just doubles, right? In the second case, the behavior is probably much worse. And likewise, if you had something which is like 2 to the n, then for n that is somewhat small, it probably is much better than this guy. But uh, but, uh, but you know that if your n doubles and your n is somewhat large, then this just becomes impossible to mm. Well, uh, and you know, in practice, there are often ways of bringing down constants by engineering that with a little bit. So that's the reason we care so much about asymptotic analysis. <coughs> so in the past, in the until the 60s, 70s, computer scientists used to care about constants as well, and then slowly the trend has shifted towards just asymptotic analysis. Okay. So if you look at all these old books by Donald Knuth and so on, he, he will have constants like oh, it's uh, and like some sort runs in 3.2 times log n log n. Okay. So so these are all. And then, yeah, so those become very tricky to do, and people got sidetracked for a while, and then they came back to asymptotic analysis. Okay, all right. So, so just a very quick example. So, suppose I gave you something like this. Yeah. So, so what would you say is the asymptotic complexity of this? N squared. Okay. So this is uh, this is O of big O of n squared. Okay. And uh, so, do you guys know what little o is? Or actually, how many of you have not seen little o? I'm sure some of you have not seen it because it's not that common. Okay, yeah. So, so little o is just a way of saying that, uh, I mean, so it's a way of giving a certain function. So, actually, let me be a bit more formal here. So, you say that some. So 
Suppose you have two functions. Okay, so f of n and g of n, then we say that f of n is little o of g of n. Really, uh, a lot of people, are, to be more precise, people often write belongs to little o of g of n, but we will often abuse, you will often see this notation equals the g of n if for any constant c, c f of n is less than c times g of n. It's maybe too mathematical, let me just break down some things. Okay, so we say that, uh, so if you have two functions, yeah, you say that f and g, we say that f is little o of g of n, if for, uh, if you have any any tiny constant c, okay, think of like c being like uh, c tending to 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 or something, for large enough n, f of n will be less than that tiny constant times g of n. So that's when we say that f is little o of g. Okay, so in this case, uh, it's, if you haven't seen this, that's a good exercise for you to see that this is, for example, little o of n cube, or even little o of n log n, okay, n squared. <laughs> so which means that basically, like if I gave you any constant, 0 0.0001, let's say, then there's some large enough n for which this function is less than 0 0.0001 times n cubed. So, so that's what we mean by the okay. So, yeah. So this is uh, another basic definition. Okay. So these are some prerequisites for, for for these kind of things. The references that I gave you are good sources. Yeah. <coughs> Any positive constants or yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all for positive constants. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Okay. So the next thing that we will assume throughout this course are things like uh, basic things about graphs. Okay. So hopefully all of you have seen at least a little bit about graphs before. So graphs are just you know a set of vertices connected by a set of edges. Edges can sometimes be directed, sometimes be undirected, and uh, edges are just yeah pairs of vertices. So and how do you store graphs? Yeah. So as I was saying, there's two very common ways. So some people store. Uh, graphs as adjacency lists, which means for every vertex you keep track of a list which consists of who else it is connected to. Okay. So maybe in this example, vertex 0 is connected to 1 and 3. So the list for 0 will contain uh, 1 and 3, list for 2 will contain let's say 1 and 4 and so on. So, so these are called adjacency lists. So this is uh, for each vertex. A list of names. And if the graph is directed, you can have a list of outgoing edges from that. And this will exactly determine the graph. And likewise, you can have a binary matrix which is called an adjacency matrix. This is uh, n times n object, where n is the number of uh, vertices in the graph. So these are called vertices, these are called edges. We sometimes use knowledge as well, these are called edges. Okay. And this is an n by n graph uh, matrix that has a 0 if there's no edge and 1 if there's an edge. Okay, so this is just a binary. Sometimes if the graph is weighted, you graph weight. So these are so that's an adjacency matrix. So can you think of why you might prefer one over the other? Yeah? Use a matrix and it's worse. Exactly. So if your graph has 
a small number of edges compared to the number of vertices. Like let's say you had uh, 100 vertices and let's say 400 edges or something. Then it's a real waste to store this 100 by 100 matrix because uh, you're storing like 10,000 uh, bytes of information while you could just have gotten away with something like 400 or 800, something like that. So, yeah. But if we use a matrix, we can perform operations on the matrix to find information back around. Exactly. So there are benefits to both. Like, if you have a matrix, uh, actually, do you have an operation in mind? That's a great answer. Um, so I think if you square the matrix, you can find cycles. Yeah, so if you have to take higher powers for that. But even very basic thing, right? Like, suppose I just ask you, are I and J connected? Now, if you, if you just had a list, you'll have to go through the list of I. You have to iterate through the list to see if J is in that list or not. Uh, but if you had a matrix, you just look up the entry. And if it's not zero, you just say there is a matrix. So, so there's some benefits to this, and as he was saying, you can do complicated things with an adjacency matrix. You can find out numbers of cycles, and you can find out cool things about them, uh, about the graph. Okay. So, so yeah. So as I was saying, data structures are all about what you want to do with them. Okay, so there's no single right data structure. So, so that's uh, that's this. And uh, I also will assume that you've seen some basic algorithms about graphs, like uh, breadth first search and depth first search. We, we we'll probably see this when we when we do the, like the shortest path algorithm. But I assume that you have seen it in some form in the past. So if you have not, I encourage you to just read some of the prereq material. So yeah, and reachability is another thing where you want to find out if you can reach one node from the other. Okay, that's what these these search algorithms allow you to do. Okay. And these are all very, very efficient. So these are all linear in the size of the graph. Note that I'm using the word linear, right? So that's just like saying it's uh, it's just O of n. Okay, so, so this is uh, And by the size of a graph, I always mean number of vertices plus number of edges. Okay. And uh, yeah. right. So, any questions on what I've written here so far? Okay. Good. All right. And uh, somewhat to a, I mean, right after the midterm, I think, we will talk about randomized algorithms. So how many of you have seen randomized algorithms before, just out of curiosity? Oh, okay, smaller than I thought. Okay. So, so yeah, so it turns out that, so, so the rest of you will have a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, you hope you want to see. But, uh, yeah, so there's, uh, randomized algorithms are this very powerful algorithmic paradigm where, uh, when you're making certain decisions in an algorithm, you do them randomly, okay? and you hope to get lucky. Okay? So you hope that oh, okay, maybe certain degeneracies are avoided in the process. Okay? It turns out we can formally prove that you can you get lucky most of the time, okay? and that's a surprising fact that you can uh, that, that turns out you can show for many problems. So these are uh, randomized algorithms. <coughs> But for analyzing randomized algorithms, you will you are expected to have some background in probability. Okay, so so some of the homework zero questions will deal with that. Okay. So you will uh, you have some things about defining random variables, finding the expected values, and so on. Okay, so yeah, you can also do actually for all of homework zero, you don't have to do the whole thing. You can do what you feel uh, you you would like to test yourself on. So that's. Okay. And you should know how to compute probability in simple language. Right? <coughs> I think there's one problem in homework zero where uh, maybe you, you may not be able to answer it. That's uh, I just have it written in the uh, next to the problem. Okay, so it's fine if you can't answer that one part. All right. Okay, so the next thing which uh, so so these are basically the prerequisites that I will assume in the course. 
And uh, you are also expected to be like somewhat familiar with mathematical arguments, induction, and things like this. Okay, so these are the rough prerequisites. Okay. So before we end, there's a few examples that I would like to just go over. These are also in the way of background, right? So the first thing is about code versus pseudocode. Okay, so I'm sure all of you have seen this. But I'd just like to point out that in this class, we will not be actually using explicit code of this kind. Firstly, because it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a mess to find out what's actually going on. So in this, yeah, in this case, maybe you can uh, you can figure it out by the names and so forth, right? But uh, but it's yeah. But we are going to use pseudocode. For example, the same thing. We'll just we, we will write it as something along these lines. Okay, so, so you assume some basic subroutines, and that's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, as long as you know what the running time of that subroutine is. Right? So, so I say here, for example, that while A is not sorted, it means implicitly that I there is a test for checking whether A is sorted or not, and I don't really expect you guys to like write this because unless there is some non-trivial implementation of that that you are referring to. Okay. So, but if it's obvious uh, implementation, you don't have to write what that is. And likewise, you can always use things that we've seen earlier on in the course. All right, so, so this is the way we will describe most algorithms. And this is how you can describe in your homeworks and so on. Okay, just describe at a somewhat high level. Uh, yeah, sometime, for some problems, you may have to go into the details because that's the only way you can do it. But that's fine. Okay, so it's uh, you will realize. That. All right. So any any questions about this? <clears throat> okay. All right. So let's. Yeah, I just thought as an uh, as an exercise and in, uh, in analysis, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit now about how you analyze algorithms, right? Analyze the running time, or how we will do so in this course. Okay, and I thought this is uh, as good an example as any to illustrate this process. Okay. So firstly, uh, do you guys recognize this algorithm? So what it's, uh, I guess I haven't given you time to parse it, so let me parse it for you. Okay, so, the, so what the algorithm is doing is, it's a procedure to sort an array. Okay, so you're given as input an array A going from 0 to n minus 1. Okay. And what it's doing is, as long as A is, a is not already sorted, you do the following, you go from left to right, and if you find any AI that is bigger than the next element, then you swap those two elements. Okay. So you want the smaller ones to come before and the bigger ones to come later. Right? So that's the goal of sorting. Right. So And you swap them. Okay. And you do that, uh, you do a left to right pass, and you just swap locally. That's what this algorithm is doing. And it just runs, it can potentially run forever, right? Because it, uh, while the array is not, as long as the array is not sorted, you do this step. Okay. So, is there an upper bound you can give on how long this procedure takes? Is the question we'd like to ask. So, first, yeah, what is this algorithm called? Okay, so I'm glad you've seen this. So, this is called bubble sorting. The name itself suggests. <coughs> What's going on? So, uh, right. So, how do we analyze bubble sort? Like, wh what would be the time complexity of this algorithm? Sorry. Okay. N squared. Okay. Uh, so, I hear n squared. Anybody else? Okay. So, so why do you say n squared? Uh, sort in the very last time and it would go over the elements n times. So it the okay, so, so what, what, what do you mean by it would go over these n times? So there are n elements in the array, suppose. Mm -hmm. And then every time it would start from the first element and sort. And then in the worst case, you would probably do that and would sort in the very last, last time. So every time it would What do you mean by the last time? There is, so as I stated this algorithm, the procedure can run forever. 
So when you're analyzing an algorithm, you've got to look at exactly what the code is saying right, or what the pseudo code is saying. Right? So it says while A is not sorted, go from left to right and do these kind of swaps. Right? So this step, what you said is great. right? So you're saying that this step takes n, n, O of n time because it just goes from left to right and it just does some local swap. If you do this, and doing a swap is just a constant amount of time. Okay? And you, you you go from left to right, so you go the whole length of the array, that is O of n. So each iteration of this while loop takes O of n time. Right? So, so this process takes O of n time. So the whole question about the analysis is how many times does this while loop run? Okay. So, sorry? Minus one time. Uh, in the worst case, uh, uh, it is oppositely sorted, and every time we have to check. But why do you say that in the worst case it is uh, it, it is in the opposite order? Right. So what you're saying is correct, but the question is why? Right. Yeah. Um, so it, it doesn't even have to be opposite sorted. It just has to have the lowest number in the previous spot to the right, because when you only swap locally two elements, then you have to move that flat, that lowest number all the way to the start of the array that you're given. And so if your array is n times, then you have to move the, the let's say, 0 n minus 1 times to the first <coughs> part. OK. So did everyone follow what he said? He explained very clearly what he said. But this, the, the flaw in his argument is that he's giving an example. So what he's saying is a lower bound in the sense that there is an instance for which the algorithm takes n squared time. And his example is the following. He's saying that if you are, uh, let's say your numbers are 1 through n. Okay? And if your 1 was far out here, and you had these guys in any order you want, 2, 3, 5, 7, n minus 1, something. Okay? So what he has observed is that in each iteration of this while loop, the one can only move one step to the left. Because you'll get to the one only in the very end. Okay. And then it moves one step. Next time you get to it, it moves one step, so on. Okay. And because you're always moving from left to right. right. So what he's saying is that for the one to get to the first position, you need at least n time. Okay. So this is a lower bound. Right? So this is saying that there is an instance, there are all these instances on which the algorithm takes is bound to take at least n squared times. But it's not showing that the algorithm always takes at most n squared times. Right? Because this is not an upper bound. Right? So do you see the Yeah. Uh, because you define that the array goes from zero to n minus one, mm -hmm. and you define that your upper bound space is on zero because you can have a number lower than zero. What do you mean? So, so no, no, forget about the zero to n minus one, right? So that's just indexing, right? So that's not important. Whether you go from one through n or zero to n minus one doesn't matter, right? It's the number of iterations. So what you would ideally like to claim is that for all inputs, right? So, so your your claim should be that for every input. The while loop runs at most n time, or something like this, O of n time. So you cannot prove this statement by giving one instance where it runs at most n times, right? So you have to say that for every input, your while loop runs at most n time. Okay. So how would you for uh, how would you now try to analyze it? Right? So what he said is a good intuition as to why in some cases it would definitely take a lot of time. Right? Uh, yeah. But how do you say that for every input it does not, for instance, can there be some worse input than what he said where maybe it runs n squared time? Like if you were to go by the, the reasoning that he gave, right? so you could you could argue that after n steps, the smallest element gets to the right place. Then you could say after n more l steps, 
or n minus 1 more steps, the second smallest element gets to the right space, and so on. So that would give you that there are roughly n squared, I mean that the while loop runs for at most n squared times, right? Because n plus n minus 1 plus so on adds up to n squared. I see some confused faces, so ask a question. So <laughs> anybody who doesn't understand this reasoning. I have one question. Yeah. So, could part of the problem be in determining whether the array is sorted? Do we <clears throat> do we have a good algorithm for saying how much time it takes to do the while a is not sorted? Yeah. So right now, actually, this is another great question, right? So what he's saying is, you know, this itself could be complicated, but how do you do this? The most naive way. Just run through the array. So that's linear time. Yeah. So, so this step is taking the naive way is O of n. So maybe there's a smarter way to do this, right? But but we don't care because in any case each iteration is taking O of n time. Okay? So adding another O of n just increases the constant a little bit, but it doesn't change the asymptotic running time. Okay. But it's a great point. You should always be careful about the subroutines you use and how much time they take. In this case, it's nice that it's taking the same amount of time or smaller the amount of time than this step. So you don't really care about optimizing that subroutine. There are problems in which you may actually care about optimizing the subroutine. So, so yeah. So, so in this case, we can just stick with the naive way of doing. All right, so, so that's good. So now, right, so, so this is what we would like to prove. Yeah. Uh, so every time the internal loop runs, we can be sure that at least one element is at its right place. OK, which element is at its right place? So if it runs the first time, the first element. If it runs the second time, the second element. So why is the first element in the right place, right? But uh, the example he gave says that if I had this array, right? So the right spot for the first element is spot number one. But if you run it once, one will only move one step to the left, right? But you're on the right track. Is there some element that gets to the right spot? The largest. the largest elements, right? So you can always say that. So what you observe here is that. Okay, so 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 this is what you would like to prove. But we are building. So this is how analysis often works. You build a set of observations by trying out some things, and you hope to just tease out a proof combining all these observations. Okay. So so what observation? Be, uh, is that after first iteration, okay, the largest element <coughs> moves to, to its right spot. So this is a great observation, right? So now you can hope that okay. So so what happens after the second iteration? Does that mean that, does that mean that the list is now n minus one unsorted elements? Yeah, you can conceptually think of it like that, right? Because the first element, is a, the largest element, has already moved to the right. There's no way it's going to get swapped or something. Uh, although note that the algorithm is not explicitly doing this, right? The algorithm is still moving to the end. But you observe that it will never get out of out of place because you know that was the largest element, right? So now you can, in some sense, think of the algorithm as just working on these n minus one things. So, so that's the idea, right? So, so in, in particular, we have this a more generalized observation that after some t iterations. The largest T element are all in that direction. 
So this is the observation we have made. And uh, if you want to be extra careful, you, you would actually want to prove this formally. Okay? So in, in this example, this is actually somewhat easy. So, so you may not feel the need for it. But there are problems in which you might want to actually prove this formula. Right? Like where this is, uh, so is this statement obvious to everyone? Right. Because, uh, but if you had to prove it, then how would you do it? Uh, let's see if somebody else, yeah. So, induction. Okay, so yeah, so induction is how you prove most statements, right? So most statements of this kind. And that's great. Yeah, so, so you can actually prove this sort of a statement by induction. Okay. So proof will be by induction. <coughs> and what does it mean to prove something, prove a statement of this kind by induction? Somebody else? You have to have a base case, mm -hmm. and then have to have the, the inductive Yeah. Okay. So, so induction proofs by induction have two steps. The first is the base case, like you were saying, and in this case, what is the base case? Okay. So t equals one, and t equals one we've already observed, right? Because we said that after the first iteration, the largest element. Okay. So proof by induction, and this is two steps. So the base case is equals one, which is this observation. And then there is what is called the inductive step. Okay. And what this means is you say that if it is true for sub p, if a statement is true for t, is true for t plus 1. Okay. So this is the inductive step. This is what we mean by the inductive step. And now what, how, how do you prove this in this uh, in, for this element? So you want to assume that your algorithm has run t times. For t iterations, your while loop will run for t iterations. Now you're guaranteed that the last, that the largest t are in the right positions. Now you'd like to argue about the t plus one largest. Right? So how do you do this? I mean, he has already done this in some sense, but yeah, just to get it uh, formally out. So is the setting clear to everyone? You assume that the algorithm has run for t iterations and it has placed the largest t guys in the right order. And uh, now it's running for the t plus 1 iteration of the while loop. You would like to argue that at the end of this, the t plus 1 first largest element comes to its right place. And so why is that true? Yeah. So we can assume that the old key sources that are the right hand side, we can consider them as a one element because we are assuming that they are sources and the largest is on the right side. Okay. So the only thing that we should consider is that the leftmost part of the thing that we already sorted T element. Mm -hmm. And just consider one element that is going now to be compared. <laughs> okay, so what he's saying is, in some sense, all of these guys, what we have shown is that after t rounds of this while loop, all of these elements in the current array are all the right elements. Okay, and these are perfectly sorted and they have been, uh, they've already, they are like the t largest elements. Now we only have to think about where the t plus first largest element was. So let's say it was here. So this was, and this is the t plus first largest element, which means that it is bigger than all the other elements. So it's bigger than, in particular, all of these elements uh, up until here. Okay. 
So now if you just do one round of this uh, of this iteration, then you are slowly swapping these things one by one, right? But you can now be sure that this element is bigger than all of these guys. So here there might be some swaps that happen, but we don't really care about this. All we care about is that this element now gets all the way here. <laughs> and this is the reason this is called the bubble sort algorithm because uh, the, the largest elements kind of bubble to the top one after the other. Right? So bubble to the right. So that's uh, so this is proof of t plus one, and this is uh, you've done this like proof that you just. So is the argument uh, clear to you guys? So it's just basically, yeah, assume it is true for t. So if you assume that after t step, t iterations, you've got all the, the largest t, right? Then you look at where this t plus first largest one was. And you argue that because of the, the way this bubble procedure works, this one will make it all the way to the so in your homework, you'll see some very, I mean, if you understood this, then it should be a trivial thing to answer, but you'll see things like other inputs where it runs way faster, other inputs where it takes a certain amount of time, or some very slight modification of the algorithm, like if I don't, uh, here it's important is that this one bubbles all the way to the top. If I just do a small amount of swaps here, if I don't do these swaps carefully, then this may not bubble all the way to the top. So you'll see examples, such examples in the moment. So, so yeah, so think about this. And so the proof of this is basically by enough. So any questions about the proof? Okay, so this is one, the first, ex your first example, you'll see lots of such formal proofs in class. Uh, but this is the first example uh, of uh, a proof by induction. Yeah. <coughs> um, so it's the observation that we make there, is that like a valid proof step to just say, here's something we've observed? Which one? The observation step? Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. Or yeah. So it's a, uh, so it is, in this case it so happened that the observation was the base case for the proof. But there will be many times when you're trying to analyze something, you have some interesting observations, but they may not tie in very formally into the proof. They may not ultimately be useful to the proof. Okay, there are still valid observations about the algorithm, right? So, and that is very common because when you're trying to come up with a proof, you'll try to make different observations about how the what the algorithm is doing. Some may not be as relevant to the proof as others. Okay, uh, yeah, and that is not point one that is relevant. Is it something we would always have to prove, or is it okay to just say, well, here's what we observe? Well, if, oh, no, 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 you, you have to prove it as long as it's not obvious, right? So, like in this case, that is, that is, an, uh, that is obvious from the way the algorithm works. Okay? Like, actually, as I was saying, in your homework, you'll see a situation where even that observation will not be true, okay? just because you swap in a slightly different way or something. So, so yeah, so, and that's important to, to know. Okay. Right? So yeah, any other yes. So <coughs> one of our observations to prove the other observation. Mm -hmm. So how do we decide that if we prove that uh, so basically after the iteration the largest we are in this is also sort of obvious when we look at the picture. And so yeah. the other observation also we got when we took one right. of the examples. Yeah, so this is a very easy example where everything is, once you make this statement, I think uh, I think this statement is the main thing about the proof, right? So, like once you make this statement, seeing that it's correct is relatively easy. But you just have to know that this is the right statement that will imply what you want, right? Because ultimately you want to say that for every input, the while loop runs, runs for at most n iteration. Okay. So, so that was not obvious from, for example, he came up with a construction that said that it can sometimes run n times, right? But, but this observation is what is allowing you to prove that it always runs at most n times. Okay. 
Okay. Because when you set t equals n, you just get that uh, after n iterations, everybody is wrong. So, so that's the main thing that, uh, and in this case, yeah, once you make this observation, it turns out to be relatively easy to show. But we don't have to do uh, anything to prove the other observations. Oh, uh, is your question that this subsumes that? Yeah. Ah, yes. So, so what she's saying, I misunderstood her initially. I thought she was saying that this observation is obvious, but I guess that's not what she's saying. She's saying that this is this subsumes that in the sense that if you set t equals one, it is that, right? So, so and that's fine, right? So, uh, because that is the base case. Okay. So, it is. That is a necessary argument for proving this. Yeah. All right. So any other comments? All right. So that's great. So I just wanted to give, take a sim simple example and write out a formal proof just to, just so that you guys are aware that this is all what goes on in our mind when we come up with problems. So. Okay, so another very simple, I think we have a couple of minutes, we'll probably come to this next uh, class again, but very basic example, hopefully all of you have seen this. Suppose you're given an array of n number, they're all in memory, and you know that they're already sorted, and now I give you an integer x, and I want you to tell me if the array contains x or not. So how would you do this? Okay, so I hear the answer everywhere. So, uh, okay, so do you want to say? Binary search it. Yeah, so you binary search for it, and uh, we'll see what that means in a little while. But, yeah. Uh, so, does anyone want to explain roughly what the idea is? Not if you know the names. Okay. This is written in multiple halves, so you look for the number x. I look for the either of the extremities on the past and it is whether the sexual line on the left half or the right half and you repeat that. Okay. So describe this in a pretty clean way. So he said that you have this array, so you call this uh, a0, a1, a2, up to a n, a n minus 1. So you split the array as equally as possible. And because it's sorted, if I just look at the element in the middle, if it's bigger than x, then I know that x has, to, if it's there, has to lie on the left. And uh, if it's uh, smaller than x, then I know that x has to lie out here, if it exists at all. And what I've done in this process is that I've reduced the size of the array in which we are searching for by a factor of 2. So, so we, we go from, so, the idea behind this is that reduces the size of the array by half. So you start off with an array of size n, now it becomes an array of size roughly n by 2. And you can keep doing this because the whole array is. So it's a very simple, uh, simple thing, and you can argue that. Uh, so initially you have an array of size n. Next time you have an array of size n by two. Next time you have an array of size of n by four, and so on. And ultimately, if you just get to an array of size one or two or something, you can just see if that element is x, and you can stop. Right. So that's sometimes the base case. So how many steps does it take? To reach that, uh, to reach that base case. Okay, log n. Okay, log n. And how do you formally get that? I mean, there's just a computation exercise. But how? How do? Why do you say it's log n? Because what I've argued is that let's say it takes some p steps. Then after t steps, this argument tells you that the size of the array you have is something like n divided by 2 to the t. 
because this is after one step, this is after two step, so on. So you can imagine that, yeah, so, so, so this is a pattern you observe. In this case, you don't even have to do an induction, it's obvious enough. Okay. And uh, so this is the size, and if this is roughly one or two, if this is a constant, then you are done. And what does it mean that this is a constant? So you have n by 2 to the t equals 1. And if you solve for this, then uh, n equals 2 to the t, which means that t is about n to the base 2. So this is by definition. So this is just a formal way of distribution. So, yeah. All right, so this is great, but note that you've really carefully used the fact that the whole array is sorted. Yeah. So, and also there's a little bit of a caveat in this analysis, which is that I've assumed that the array is already there and sorted and addressable in memory. Right? Like if I have to read in the array, then it doesn't work. You have to read in the whole array. Or okay, so assume that your array is in memory. And yeah, you can think about what if even like one element is out of place. We can still show that you have to search for the whole area and things like that. Okay. All right, so let's stop here. And, uh, see you guys on the